But let's begin by coming into our meditation posture, allowing our spine to lengthen and straighten as we sit fully. Bringing our awareness in gathering into this body. aware of sensory perception in the body. Aware of peripheral appearances in the mind. and settling into a state of relaxation as we come to the crown of our head and allow our attention to begin to float down slowly, releasing and softening and relaxing any tension we might find. Permission to relax Notice the brow around your eyes. Your jaw. Into your neck. and across your shoulders, allowing them to fully relax. Float down your arms, past your elbows, all the way to the tips of your fingers. Feel your hands resting gently in your lap. Then returning to the nape of the neck, begin to float down through the torso. Coming into your upper back. Around your shoulder blades. Your chest. down to the solar plexus where there is often a tangle of tension. Let your belly release, relax, soften to receive the full breath. Let your glutes be soft and your hips relax as you come all the way to your sit bones. And then float down your legs. Let your thighs be soft. Give some loving energy as you pass your knees. Down your calves. All the way to the soles of your feet and the tips of your toes. Let every cell in your body release. 
settling into a deep state of relaxed and peaceful ease. Remaining upright, attending to the sensation of the breath as the body breathes. Feeling the places where your body touches the seat, a sense of being grounded and stable and safe. Without force or impedance, without preference for long or short, allow the body to breathe and attend to the sensation within the body. And fine-tuning our awareness, I invite you to bring your attention to the sensation at the tip of the nose and attend to the entire cycle of breath as it flows in and back out as one for 10 cycles. And now by way of considering our intention for being here, think about this text written by the seventh Dalai Lama, which describes the three principal aspects of the path. And he says, whatever you want for yourself and others, with a human form is easily attained. Disengage yourself from meaningless efforts and strive to accomplish the highest goal. Because all things composite are impermanent, life changes and never abides. That change is the basis for suffering. For the samsaric mind, fills with frustration upon watching its creations continually fade. The higher you climb in samsara, 
the higher the cliff on which you perch. The more things you own, the tighter you are bound. The dearer you hold someone, the greater the chance you will be hurt. The faster you subdue enemies, the faster their numbers increase. This body is a thing borrowed for the moment. And possessions are things stored for others. Now we dally with them, but quickly are they lost or misused and only become sources of misery. Therefore, no worldly possession is worth the effort of gaining. Turn your back on that which only handicaps. An unburdened mind is joy supreme. The pinnacle of aims is to follow this path, body, speech, and mind kept stainless in pure self-discipline. Mind held in samadhi, blissful and clear. And wisdom, seeing all realities in every situation. The mother beings, wandering in the six realms, to me, their child, are pieces of my heart. For in many ways have they soothed my troubles, and in infinite ways have they brought me joy. These infinite beings, so kind, are covered by the fog of ignorance. Constantly lashed by whips of delusion, they have no chance to lay down the burden of misery from their minds. Therefore, Whenever you greet anyone, meet them with eyes smiling with love. Why mention that you shouldn't even consider holding evil intentions or deceptive thought? The way people and things seem to be, other than projected labels, is a distortion created by deluded mind. If we look at the root of things, emptiness is clearly understood. And in the vast space of the perception of emptiness, mental grasping for the ultimate subsides. And when one looks into the face of the world, everything is seen without essence. Understanding interdependence, one understands emptiness. Understanding emptiness, one understands interdependence. This is the view which is the middle and is beyond the terrifying cliffs of eternalism, nihilism, neither or both. These are the three principal aspects of the path, states of mind to be generated through the power of practice, renunciation or definite emergence, bodhicitta, the great longing to reach full enlightenment for the welfare of others, and wisdom, realizing the final nature, how things actually exist. And so this is our purpose, to realize these states of mind in order to be of the greatest benefit to everyone we meet, to each and every living being without exception, and without delay of a second. That's a good meditation. Mm -hmm.
Where does the sound go? So maybe we can just take one moment to settle the energy. So welcome all of you who are out in Zoom land and appreciate you being here. <laughs> um, as we get started, does anyone have any questions or comments about our time together yesterday or last weekend before we begin? Did you ruminate over the night on anything that you needed to bring up or discuss? Have a question, comment? I have a comment. Please. Do you remember the discussion about doing the 100,000 water bowls or I think it was Shanka's Shanka's question about a hundred thousand water bowls. And what was my answer? <laughs> my helpful answer? Uh, is that it's not about the this is my takeaway. Please. It's not about the number of water bowls that you might accomplish at any particular time, except not about the number, it's about the presence. Not about the number, it's about the presence. That was precisely what I intended. And that, that's just why I always am in that gear. In that gear. She's in that gear. That's a wow. Okay, very good. That is, no, that's very good. That's, that's really good. The point is, that's the, that's the place to be all the time. And when you get that, you're free. Because you all know the causes of happiness and the causes of suffering. So when you understand and when you are aware in every moment, as much as possible, then you don't get trapped. And you are free. It's... It's, it's an interesting and beautiful and calm and peaceful place to be without grasping, without ruminating over the past or the future, just being present. So yesterday we went through, is anything else? Does anybody else have anything they want, wish to share? Or I have something. Um, I want to... I Whoever asked the question about... Um, I think you're muted. No. Nope. Oh, wait. Maybe it's the computer. Just a moment. We're going to see our... Fix all of our uh, uh, parts. Try again. How about now? Perfect. Okay. I want to thank whoever asked the question about stopping the, the thoughts in your mind during meditation. I've been thinking about that for um, a while th this past week, and um, it definitely was freeing to me to know that, hey, I'm normal. <laughs> I'm not a failure with my meditation, and that that's okay. So whoever asked that question, thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. It's important for us to share these kinds of uh, realizations with one another because we become uh, we become real with each other in terms of our we're all the same really we're we're going through the stages and these things come up and we have questions but oftentimes you don't want to ask the question because you think oh you know i'm the only one that asked that question but in fact it's just people being shy to ask a question or to uh say something about their experience. So sharing your experience, whether it's mundane or whether it's ecstatic, are really helpful for all of us in our state of practice that we are. Anything else? Okay. Um, if anyone in the audience here sees anyone in the audience there because you've got bigger screen than I do that has their hand up. Would you please draw me my attention? Okay, thanks. 
So uh, yesterday we went through the first, I think, five or six verses of uh, Tilopa's Ganges Mahamudra with some commentary on those. And I want to turn now to Ponlap Rinpoche's teachings that I received uh, two years ago because I find them super helpful and I may have time to go back to Tilopa's Ganges Mahamudra at the, this afternoon, we'll see. But I really want to do some meditation uh, in order to get a taste of meditation, a taste of Mahamudra, a taste of the natural state of our mind. It is helpful to do brief meditations you know, short ones. So we're gonna, we're going to do um, at least maybe four or five, five minute meditations. And we're going to have a discussion or a sharing of what you think about that before we move on to the next, the next topic. So I'm going to share Ponlap Rinpoche's teachings and, uh, Right, that's that's good enough, dear. So it, it began with homage to the gurus. So without the gurus, you know, the reason I think you will find that almost every treatise, every text, begins with an homage to the lineage gurus of that particular uh, teaching, and I think it might be Chandra Kirti's that that bows down to compassion. I can't remember, but one of them. But anyway, but. Almost all the treatises begin with an homage to the lineage masters because the teachings come from the lips of the teacher to the ears of the student in an unbroken lineage all the way back to the Buddha. It's not something that's made up by some kind of new age psychology. No, all of these teachings can be traced right back to the Buddha through this teacher, then this teacher, to this teacher. The Mahamudra teachings go from Shakyamuni Buddha to Bodhisattva Vajrapani to Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Gampopa, Pagmo Drupa, uh, the founder of the uh, Drupa Kagyu lineage, Repa Pema Dorje, all the way through to Jamyang Kense, who is a, was a um, contemporary of, of our previous teachers, and to... Uh, Ponlap Rinpoche. So he received this lineage and he passed it on. But many, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has passed on this uh, Kagyu, Gelug, Mahamudra. Many, as I mentioned yesterday, Lama Yeshe often talked about Mahamudra as he was giving other teachings. And certainly Lama Zopa Rinpoche has given Mahamudra teachings in our lineage and others, others as well. Kirti Sencham Rinpoche, Chodan Rinpoche. So I've received this Mahamudra teaching on many different occasions from in many different ways. So this one I want to, uh, I want to share with you. Do you remember Mahamudra, what it is? The great seal, the seal, which is what? It's true. That's what it means, the great seal or the great symbol. That's exactly right. But what is this What is this great maha, this great seal that pervades everything? Yes, sir. Emptiness. 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 It's the unity of emptiness, the wisdom of emptiness. <clears throat> it's... The key instructions are a mind free of mental engagement. A mind free of mental engagement. It's described in, in four parts, in the view, the meditation, the fruit, and the conduct. So the view is to thoroughly examine or investigate our mind. Thoroughly examine and investigate the mind. And the whole point is to recognize the true nature of the mind, to see the truth, 
as Lama Tsongkhapa says, you know, wisdom, realizing the final nature, how things actually exist. And the meditation, the second, is resting the mind. Resting the mind. The fruit is correcting any misunderstanding of mind. And the conduct is our daily practice. How we take the path into our daily life. And the point, the point is to see the truth. Seeing the truth, it is said, will dissolve delusions, dispel confusion, liberate us, and awaken us. So in the view, we investigate the mind. We see the nature of mind. We have to know what mind is. We have to know our own habits of mind. We have to investigate the mind first. So how do we do that? How do we investigate the mind? So this is within meditation, you know, within contemplation, through the contemplations in meditation. And through our own experience, it's through our own individual experience that we search. It's not through intellectual reasoning. Not through intellectual reasoning. It's through experience. Like, what is that? We've been intellectualizing our whole life. We started when we were little. (laughs) As soon as we could understand words, we were trying to understand and intellectualize. So Naropa said to Marpa, what is mind? Mind is mere movement, recollection and awareness. It has no intrinsic nature. So this thing called mind is what we examine first in the first stage. the great Saraha, the great yogi, he said, mind itself is alone, the seed of all. From it, all of samsara and nirvana flow. Bondage is simply the mind being bound. And if it is free, without a doubt, that is liberation. When the mind itself is twisted into knots, then it is loosened, we are liberated. If we can let the mind be in its natural state, liberation can be found right there. Religiosity makes it complicated. So if we can free this mind, that's where liberation is. So the key is to investigate the mind. If the mind is in its natural state, it is free of bondage. So then what's binding it? Hmm? What's binding it? You have an idea? What did you say, Charlene? Delusions. A mental grasping and habitual thinking? Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So, Ponla Rinpoche says it's thought processes, which include all that you mentioned. He said, really, it's quite simple. When we liberate the mind from thought, the mind's nature will shine naturally, freely. And if we truly take a look at the mind right now, we can see that its true nature is what we call wisdom. Wisdom Buddha. It's there in this very present moment. It is there. If we can look at the essence of the present mind, not mixed with thought, what comes about gradually is the experience of seeing the true nature of mind. So in in this case, you know, it's not like being spaced out. 
and we will we'll practice so that we can see what it means. It's meditating and looking at the nature of this present mind, free from thoughts. So just for one minute, just look. Sometimes for me, it is to find the mind. In the beginning, it was easiest for me to drop into my heart, bringing the mind right here, and then let it expand until it comes to a place that's naturally resting. So when you look, what do you see when you look? What do you see? So first, at the beginning, when we turn our mind in and drop in and drop any thought of this or that or where you're looking. So if you feel the presence of the present nature of mind, that there there is an awareness, a sense of being aware This clarity, this openness, this awareness, this is the nature of mind. So I want to do a five-minute meditation. Okay? So direct your attention inward and look nakedly at the nature of the present mind. Be relaxed and at ease in a state of looking and then naturally settle See that there really is an experience to be had of the true nature of mind. Look nakedly and experience directly the nature of your present feelings and so forth. Allow the self to naturally settle within that looking.
simply allowing appearances to be nothing but the play of mind. So we examine the mind. What do we see? What's your experience? <laughs> you see thoughts. Charlene, thoughts, you saw thoughts? Hmm? Space. Mm-hmm. Poppy flowers, lots of poppy flowers. And then I reminded myself to not see poppy flowers. And then I was quiet. And then poppy flowers again. <laughs> but then again, I was quiet. <laughs> so. Okay. Great. Lou? I've had a great difficulty. Whenever I try to do that, draw back and look at my thoughts, they go. It's like they're hiding someplace. I can't bring them up. It's like so. So you were looking for thoughts. Yes, and they weren't there to be found. What was there? Nothing. <laughs> so I figured I was doing something wrong. Something. Something was there because something was looking for I thoughts. Was there, nothing else. So there was an empty mind. Mind is the space within which thoughts appear. I know that if I was looking for them, then they yeah, may keep them from appearing, so I could rather stop looking for them. Mm -hmm. It's within that space that you were. You see, that was awareness. You were so you dropped into awareness, and then nothing appeared. Right. The only thing that appeared was my usual ear noise. So you heard sound? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sound as mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it appeared within awareness. You see, this is what we're... Outside. I knew it was there, but it's always there. You, yes, you were aware of that, but you didn't attend to it. So you did drop into awareness that was awareness because you were aware it wasn't like you were not aware right right venerable plants 
Plans. Mm -hmm. That's what appeared. Oh, yes, that's that's the good one with the lists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. I forget. Joy? No. Judith. Judith. Sorry. I, I have. Um, I have been doing. Um, I want to have a job. Mm -hmm. And yes, and yesterday, I think it was yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, he went with me. The day before. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who uh, works with people who don't have all the things that that the young ones should have. Mm -hmm. And they go over high school. Three times. So were you in this time of looking, you were looking and what was coming up for you was your seeking or thinking about this job and thinking about that? That and my sister. And your sister. So thoughts were coming to you while you were looking at the nature of your mind. I felt like I was home. Uh-huh. And within that home, thoughts were coming. It's it's finally done. I mean, I I can I can almost talk here, mm -hmm. and um, I was so happy. Mm -hmm. Good. And, and I know how the different people, or the the either the young ones, when we have a party or anything, it's amazing. For them. Mm -hmm. So was this coming up in your mind when you were sitting looking at the nature of mind today? This was what was coming up for you. And nature okay. of mind for me means that I can I can go back and work on these on this place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Nature of mind means you can go within and work on that whatever is arising in that mind. Yeah, so yeah. 60 years yeah. of yeah. my sister. Yeah, okay, good, good. And is it Ruth? Yeah. Leah. Leah. I don't know, I see your face and I wanna say Ruth. Leah. Um, I was listening to the birds and I felt spacious and a few thoughts popped up, but it was more of a sense of physical. I noticed more of like, um, like a physical relaxation. Mm -hmm. Physical relaxation, mm -hmm. um, bird sounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Shanka. Um, just vastness of space that pervades, like feels like every, just pervades all material things, you know, just unending vast space. And um, then when thoughts rose, they're kind of like, they always come from my bottom right. Like they're bubbles that come up and they kind of disappear. So. So you, you saw vast empty space and when thoughts bubbled up coming on your right, uh, they just sort of disappeared. You didn't attend to them, you didn't grasp them. And Gretchen, once, once you did, okay. But you saw the difference then between grasping and not grasping. Mm -hmm. And Gretchen saw poppies. <laughs> yeah, I was grasping too. And, and um, I followed some kind of the same thing and then just really um, breathe gently into keeping my mind open. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I saw, mm -hmm. I like to visualize. I love visuals. I love the bright poppies. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> so yeah, the bright okay. pop color. Thank pop. you. Okay, good. <laughs> Sheila. I have to have you unmute. <laughs> I was having an imaginary argument in my mind. And so I was just completely off base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. I know that one. Mm-hmm. Karen, how about you? I know that Karen wasn't feeling well this morning, so perhaps she's lying down. So, Anna, are you there? Okay. I think when people turn their cameras on, I will, or or mics on, I will. We can attend. So that's interesting, isn't it? Interesting to see the different times. This isn't the case. Whatever's arising in your mind in the moment isn't always what's arising in your mind. But for instance, as you were saying, Lou, that you didn't, nothing was coming in your mind. So that you had a, you had a, a still mind. Still, you were aware because you could, if you turned your mind to it, you're, you could hear the inner sounds, but nothing was arising in the mind. So this actually, this nothing arising in the mind is naked awareness. We're not trying to conjure any, any thoughts in this moment yet. We're not trying to conjure thoughts. What we're trying to do is look through the veil of what's arising in the mind to see the space within which all of this cacophony of plans and birds and sensations and past history, all of this, all the thoughts, the lists, the mental images, to see that there's nothing wrong with any of them. There's nothing wrong. They're coming and it's okay because that's the nature of mind is to know what is appearing. Our point is to try to understand this space-like true nature of mind beyond thought, beyond that, this empty, open, spacious, blue sky mind. So uh, that's the basis that we're starting from. So in this context now, from that base, from this base of awareness, this naked awareness, we set out to examine the mind. And we do so relying on arising, abiding, and dissolving. So this is what happens to everything that appears to mind. It arises, it abides, and it dissolves or disappears. Every single thing. So we examine arising, abiding, and departing. Ponla Rinpoche calls it. So in the first stage, we direct our attention in. Nakedly looking at the nature of this very present mind. We direct our attention in. What is the state of this mind in this moment? Vividly clear, vividly empty, vibrant. Doesn't mean that there's not a thought that's about to appear, but in this, sometimes we'll get a glimpse. Just our empty, ordinary mind. And we rest directly within that, allowing ourselves to settle naturally. That's what we did in this moment. That's what we did. We settled into this present moment, just allowing the mind to be. And sometimes we get a glimpse of it without the plans, without the thoughts or in between, in between them. Because most of the time, a thought comes, or much of the time, a thought comes, it doesn't stay, and then another thought comes after it, a different one, because the first one sort of conjured the second one. It had a, a, a relationship to it, and so the second one comes. But there's a gap and so you mind the gap. You know, there's a, there's a sign in the London subway that says, mind the gap. <laughs> you know, I always think of this when I say mind the gap, thinking, seeing through beyond 
these thoughts. So secondly then, so within resting and looking at the mind, what happens within that is that the mind moves. You know, we might have this empty, spacious mind, but there's a movement, there's a thought that arises. So we look and we analyze within that state of resting, naturally settled, when a thought or movement dawns, or we intentionally bring one, if none comes, we look directly at that movement. As Shanka mentioned, his comes from the right. So he has obviously been looking. Mine comes from the left. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> so when we look directly at the nature of the thought that has arisen, okay, you just, that thought arose. And if you look directly at the nature of it, it's vibrantly empty. So we can't point and say, this is what it is. So we're going to do another meditation. And in this retreat that I did with Ponlap Rinpoche two years ago, they always started with um, resting evenly in present moment awareness, you know, resting evenly, all your energy is settled evenly within the body. So that's the posture that we take is this rest. The body is naturally resting evenly in naked awareness. So we begin by resting evenly in present moment awareness, directing our attention inward and looking nakedly at the nature of the present mind. Be relaxed and at ease in a state of looking, looking, like to see vibrantly, vividly, with energy, and then naturally settle in that looking. And when the mind moves, look directly at the nature of the thought not its content, just looking at a freshly arising thought. And when it's vibrantly clear, it arises, then just let go.
we begin to see that the nature of thought is essenceless. Within a resting mind, when a thought appears, we look directly and perhaps even see when it begins to bubble up, begins to poke its nose, but merely by looking, it doesn't come, perhaps. Okay, I turned my alarm, my, my bell down so low, I almost couldn't hear it. <laughs> okay, so this looking, you know, this looking, nature of mind, nature of thought. So this next set of meditations is to look with this vivid emptiness and clarity and wonder where did the thought arise? Where did it, where did it come from? You know, we're going to look to see where did it, where did it come from? And then we'll look where did it abide? And then where did it depart? Does it arise and does it depart? So done on the basis of this vivid, clear mind, not chasing relatively like what the thought meant, you know, what was its content? Where did it come from? How come I, when the bird sang, I thought of the tree in my backyard and then, you know, they cut that down and those were the chainsaws and not like that. It's just just you, just we ask that question. So within mind itself is a way of looking, looking at the nature of the self even, which looks from the point of view of the origin of the nature of mind. So it's important for us to really look at these aspects because we think that thoughts that come are so real and that they have a purpose and we need to think about them. And it's true that if you have an agenda that you need to be thinking about, yes, you have to make the plan and you have to do the thing. And, and that's, but that's intentional, uh, intentional thinking. And that is different than the mind that's like the, what do they say, the circus train. It's just ongoing. You have your monkey mind socks on. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yes. And uh, what I 
what I know to be true is that the more busy we are in our life, the faster the monkey climbs the tree. Because the more input that we have, the busier the mind is. And that's just simply the way it is. So I don't know if you feel like you need to stand up. We're going to do another brief meditation on the arising. Do you feel like you want to stretch for a minute? Stretch out a leg? <laughs> I like those monkey side, those monkey socks, monkey mind socks.
Okay. Let's once again settle. Resting evenly in momentary present awareness. Momentary present awareness. Moment by moment by moment. We direct our attention inward. And look nakedly at the nature of the present mind. Relaxed and at ease. In a state of looking. And then naturally settle. And when the mind moves, look directly at that nature of the thought and wonder, where did it rise in the beginning? In the very beginning of the thought. Where did it arise? Naked, spacious, open mind within which everything is contained, attending to that spacious, empty, naked awareness. Settling naturally. And when the mind moves, from where did it arise in the beginning? Allow the mind to be expansive.
So what did you see? Could you find a place where a thought arose? <laughs> you think there it comes from your head so it exists there prior Feels like it's coming from the right side of your brain. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then lunch comes. Mm-hmm. And then food, lunch, texting. It must be this way and it must be that. <laughs> You know, the thought comes and then we are propelled to, it, we are, we are propelled to speak or to act. You know, first comes the thought, yes. right? So if the thought arises and we leave it alone, we're just in space, the spacious naked awareness and the thought arises, where does it come from? And rather than say, oh, it feels like it's coming from here, feels like it's coming from here, feels like it's coming from here, oh, and you go into the whole scientific aspect of where thoughts come from, or then, you know, the, the possibility of lunch comes, you know, that thought comes. What if you leave that thought alone and settle back down in? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, the breath is always an anchor. It's true. So, oh, for heaven's sakes, breathe. Yes. Okay, breathe. Bring back. And in a way, um, in a friendly way, just say, there you are, girlfriend. You're out there doing that thing. Come on back. You know, so it is uh, really, again and again, we train ourselves to come back rather than succumb to what has arisen. We, it's a, that's how we train the mind for sustained attention. Rather than following what's coming, we come right back to the purpose. You know, in this moment, in different meditations, we have different objects. So the object in this meditation is nature of mind, you know, pure, spacious nature of mind, empty. So that's our object. And whatever is coming in and disturbing our attention to that is peripheral awareness. It starts peripherally. It comes from, where does it come from? This is what we're seeking, you know, answers to that. And what we see, well, when we look, how about somebody else? What, what uh, did anyone else, what's another experience? Um, <clears throat> One second, Lou. At first I thought it was coming. Uh-huh. Then I First, you thought it was coming from, from the head, from the right side, the side, coming from the right. Mm -hmm. I always had a constant sensation of feeling every day. Oh, okay. And I thought it was coming from that feeling. Okay. It seemed to come from in the middle, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so first it came from the side of your face because you have a sensation generally there, a feeling there, and you looked there, and you said, and then it disappeared from there, and it came sort of to the center here. But for sure, inside the head somewhere. Okay, typical, you know, in the brain, it's coming from the brain. Because, yes, that's a very typical, very, very uh, typical. Anybody else have an idea where it came from for you? Oh, yes. Gretchen, you had, was, or was it Sheila? <laughs> it was Gretchen. Okay. Um, yeah, some of them came from my chest. Like, it was a stress response. 
And then it kind of arised from my chest. And then I noticed I had a voice trying to control or conduct. Like, oh, it's coming from <laughs> your chest. Now relax the mind. I'm like, oh, I have this voice that's conducting. I wonder about this voice. Um, and maybe I need it for now until I get into the habit of acknowledging thoughts, where they're coming from and re- letting them go. I'm not sure. That's what I wanted to ask you about this voice, this conductor. <laughs> Eventually, the conductor must be silenced. But uh, occasion, you know, it is true that you, you, when you recognize that, th- that this is happening, there is a thought coming, and that you, you do recognize it. And typically, in the beginning, you have the conductor that's saying, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing now. Uh, this is what you're doing, or this is why this is coming. So whatever the intellectual is doing, uh, eventually, it's it, unless you look for that, unless you're actually conjuring the conductor, it's best, I believe, not to allow the conductor to speak. Because I can get into a habit of that, of saying, okay, now do it like this. Oh, it is like that. Oh, that's right. Better here. You, know, you can get into the habit of that in the beginning of your, and it's the best thing to do is to recognize whatever is coming. Doesn't matter. Poppies, conductors, doesn't matter. Whatever, as soon as you recognize something has arisen in the mind, if you look right at it without, without uh, comment, just go, it's kind of like, hmm. Just curious where it came from. Then, if it's true that the mind is completely empty, this awareness is completely empty. It's not produced of causes. It doesn't cease. It's, it's always there. So it has its... As Ponla Rinpoche said, it's primordially baseless, primordially baseless. So if that's true, there's no ground, there's no place for the arisal or the storage of these various thoughts and feelings and emotions and poppies. <laughs> there's no base, there's no ground. So we look at the essence of these freshly arising thoughts and experiences and the vibration is emptiness if you look at it it's emptiness there's really no base for it to arise so we're experiencing the true nature of mind when we're looking at thoughts and feelings and emotions as empty simply an appearance to the true nature of the mind doesn't have an origin point. And if we look in this way, the essence of thought is emptiness. It's very essence. So if we just examine thoughts without looking at their nature, so if we just examine it and think about it and look at it and talk about it, that's not Mahamudra. Looking at it, looking at its essence nakedly with nothing to grasp, it dissipates and we can't find it. We can't find it. We don't know. You, you look, you can't find it. So there's a vivid clarity and a vibrant emptiness. It's not that we don't see. We do see, we do see clearly and we see it's empty of any inherent existence. And in that way, there's nothing to disturb the mind. There's nothing that arises that can disturb the mind if we are able to see it as empty. It's interesting. So when we look and say, where does that come from? That's what we investigate. It's just a looking, though. It's not an analysis. 
like you are when we're looking for the I. There, that is an analytical meditation on emptiness. This is simply looking without without uh, analysis, without conceptualizing. So then we a question we make we ask the question, all right, when it arises, where does it abide? When a thought comes, where does it stay within this naked awareness? Where is it? We examine the nature of the experience of the thought, the appearance of it. What is it? And is there a place or an essence, you know, some essence to the experience? Can we identify what is appearing, its aspect? So we just ask these short pithy questions without answers. We're not, we're not asking for answers. So it's, where is it? Where does it abide? How is it appearing? What's its aspect? So it's interesting, if you're actually looking at a thought in this way, rather than the content of the thought, do you see what I'm saying? It's very interesting how you see that the thought is just, it falls apart. So we'll do another five minute meditation. So once again, we settle into our meditation seat, sitting fully and rest in momentary present awareness, directing our attention inward, looking nakedly at the nature of the present mind. Relaxed and at ease in a state of looking and then naturally settle in that state. When the mind moves, look directly at the nature of the thought. Direct, naked looking. And ask, where did it come from? Look. Where is it? Looking inward and experiencing it. Don't use logical reasoning. Just look. Where does it come from and where does it abide? Not thinking, just look.
Where does it abide? Does it have a place? Did it come? Did you have a thought that you saw come and appear somewhere? My problem was that when I dropped everything and started looking, I started waiting. The noise, the outside noise, like throw times, it sort of like just killed my whole mind. There was nothing there but the noise of the road tires. The noise. Mm -hmm. You had that too? It just drowned everything out. Outside noise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was like I actually filtered that out, but when I dropped it, it just Funny, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> Shanka. Something happened that doesn't happen very often, but was it has been happening today, which is that which is interesting because speaking about the road noise and like somebody's phone was vibrating and so forth and so on. I could tell the different, like I could see, I could perceive the ear consciousness perceiving, I don't want to say seeing. It's okay. Perceiving the noise. You could perceive, you could hear. The ear consciousness, then I could. Ear consciousness, I'm saying this for the benefit of the Zoom land. You could perceive ear consciousness Hearing this, hearing, the, hearing noise, the noise, and then the mental consciousness and having this bubble up thought like there's a phone, right? You know, that mental consciousness, mental consciousness then, then labels, thought. yeah, that labeling thought, you know, it doesn't happen very often to me, but this today I was really could distinguish, you know, the two different consciousnesses having this first, kind of, first the, the sound and then the label. And you were able to actually distinguish that when that happened, the sound came, the label came. And then I could also, and then like when the abiding part, I could feel that, you know, the ear consciousness, the hearing consciousness was just kind of, it was just the abiding part was just kind of coming up and then just there, you know, and then the mental consciousness had the thought that rose and then it was just there and then both dissipated. So you were actually able to watch the, the sound come, the label process, abiding for a second or two, and then dissipating. Without getting attached. To Without, yeah, not like, yeah, oh, I wish they would turn their phone off and I wish we were in a, in a peaceful forest setting or any of the other things that go on when we have these. Like if, uh, if I were in a tree and I've heard a noise... I wouldn't be able to distinguish between the rising of the noise and the rising of the thought. I mean, I could watch the thought, certainly. I could, you know, but I wouldn't be able to just, I haven't usually in the past been able to distinguish between the two. You know? Right. So, so you now in the past haven't really been able to catch the sound prior to the label and notice when that actually happened to actually hear the sound, notice then the label comes. It, that's uh, interesting, isn't it? When you're you because you were looking, you see this. You were looking where, where is it coming from, and where does it abide? That was the instruction. Not that you were now repeating that instruction over and over and over again, but that was the instruction. So you had an intention to look, and to see where it would abide, and you at that actually makes the mind more in tune with what's actually happening. What is the process that's happening that keeps us trapped? But there's no, if there's no uh, conjuring of concept, no ongoing grasping and thinking about it and making a story about it, that's the way the mind works. Appearances appear, sensations appear, sensory perceptions and phenomenal appearances arise and we label them. But we don't recognize that it's just a thought coming upon which we're placing a label. And when we place the label, we see it is real. And it's in meditation that we are actually able to watch it disappear without grasping it. And we train the mind to do that, to see it as empty, right? Anybody else have a comment? Please. I saw my thought and then I realized I 
just it's from a memory. Yay, I found that word. <laughs> you and saw then, a thought and said it's from a memory. Oh, good. And then you went to your memory. Yeah, back where I started, like, I have to move up to this. You know, right? Right. Yeah, they come for sure. Yeah. Yeah. As Master Talopa says, think of the mind as having no thought other than repetition. So they do come recollection and appearances. This is what happens. And it's normal. You see, that's the problem that we think we have. Oh, I can't meditate because all this is happening. <laughs> normal. You know, it's completely normal. <clears throat> it's being able to be aware, to be awake and aware as the process is unfolding. And it's very, it's much more difficult uh, in our daily life. You know, as difficult as it is on the cushion, it's difficult in our life to be able to not get uh, seduced by the label and then go for it. I also had lots of thought about the Red Sox. Oh, you had thoughts about the Red Sox. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I will share with you that Keith, I spoke to my partner, Keith, last night, and he said he was at a restaurant and somebody came up to him and said, so what about those Red Sox? And of course, Keith doesn't have a clue about the Red Sox, but he's driving Shanka's car. We bought Shanka's car and the license plate says Red Sox. So both Keith and I often have people come up to us and say, what about those Red Sox? <laughs> That's a very funny thing. That's a funny story. But we do see it's it's good to be able to see what is arising in our mind. Take a look and see what's coming. Because some of it is disturbing. And some of it is just terribly depressing. And some of it is totally neutral. It just arises and it passes. So we, we really do, um, we benefit from spending time seeing what is the habit of our mind. And then off the cushion, we can kind of take a look at that. We can take a look at that habit and see those things we wish to augment and those things we wish to purify, right? Anything? All um, right. Yeah. Yes, Gretchen. Well, it, it just seemed like at the very beginning, I was easy to I thought it would arise and I was able to get it, a habit dissolve or it would dissolve. But then after a little bit, I noticed I was more engaged in the process. And, you know, and, and like, like understanding that I'm labeling and grasping and all of that, you know, I was like, oh, I'm doing all that again. It, yeah, it's like it, the habit of doing that needs to increase. And I'm wondering, is it spending more time alone, like in a cave or so to speak? <laughs> it is practice. It is continually practicing. When you recognize that you have been grasping, that, that the, the thought has been grasped and you release it and come back to true nature of mind again and again, and again, this is the way the mind works. There is, you direct your attention and then it goes poof off the attention. You direct it back again. Sustained attention is much more difficult than we think. You think, oh yeah, I did just sit down. You know, I should be able to meditate, relax, easy going. Yeah. And then there's a train wreck. So it is in the beginning directing the attention to the object, directing it. And as soon as we realize, poof, directing it back again and again, again and again, and pretty soon, well, maybe not pretty soon, but in a while, at some point in time, it begins to say, wow, this is the object. And this is more important than the tires or any appearance or the red socks or 
plans, memories. This present moment awareness is the most important thing. And then slowly, there's a wider gap that you're able to stay for longer periods of time within that present moment awareness. That's just, but it comes from training. In his book, John Yates, uh, The Mind Illuminated or Illuminated Mind, he explains that very well, how it is that you sustained attention must be trained. It will not happen by you saying, okay, now I'm not going to let my mind go anywhere but right here. It's not the habit. The habit is to go out and look and see. It's, it's just in the DNA because of our, the way we, the, what we can see. We can see. We're always scanning for something more interesting. We're always looking for something interesting. We watch. And then what is it that we're going to grasp? And it is this understanding of naked awareness that informs our actions so that we are then able to abide by the 10 virtuous actions because we recognize the habit of our mind. So shall we make a prayer for lunch? Yeah. We'll bless the lunch and then people can go and have as they will. We'll just make a very brief dedication that, that we actually could, quicker than quick, actualize this perfect concentration so that we can grow our wisdom. Grow our wisdom, become Buddhas, and be of great benefit. So now we can visualize the kindness of the people who have prepared and delivered and brought to us the food. You know, it doesn't come by the by, but through their kindness, thanking them, and then visualize this skies of beautiful food that we're going to offer not only to all the holy beings, to all of our lamas, but that no being ever has to go hungry. Okay? Lama Sange Lama Chudejin Lama Okay, we'll come back at one thirty. Thank you very much.